Democrats in Congress took the first step today toward going it alone on President Biden's $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill. Biden met yesterday with Republican senators proposing a much smaller relief package. But the administration says Americans need the president's larger plan, and they need it really fast. That has some Republicans complaining that Biden's call for bipartisanship and unity is hollow. Here's what GOP Senator Rob Portman of Ohio said on Sunday. My hope is that, again, the inaugural address will not just be uh, good rhetoric, but actually be practice. And I think it's really in the, in the interest of the Biden administration not to do what the Democrats on the Hill are planning to do. It would use what's called reconciliation. And basically what it says is you ignore the interests of the of the minority party and just jam it through. Reconciliation may sound like an obscure parliamentary procedure, but it has been used 21 times since 1980. And I was born in 1981, just to give you a little context. Republicans used it to pass Trump's tax cuts in 2017. They used it twice in failed attempts to gut the Affordable Care Act. And now that Democrats control the Senate, they have the power to use reconciliation. Remember what Mitch McConnell said when he rushed through the confirmation of Justice Amy, Amy Coney Barrett before the November election? I do. He said, elections have consequences. Hmm, interesting. And joining us now is Democratic Senator Kirsten Gillibrand of New York. Senator, we'll get to the COVID relief bill in just a moment, but since I have you here, um, it's really important that I ask you, as an advocate, outspoken advocate for survivors of sexual assault, what your reaction was to Congresswoman uh, Ocasio-Cortez's IG Live last night, where she talked about surviving sexual assault and the trauma she experienced in the riot on January 6th. Well, I think she's very brave. And I think coming forward creates space for other survivors to come forward. And I think the trauma that anyone would face having not only endured sexual assault, but then what happened on January 6th is real. Uh, the fact that uh, people attacked the Capitol, intended to do people harm, intended to do Alexandria harm, that's significant. And these are things we should not make light of. These are things that need proper accountability and we need to have justice in these instances. And that's why we believe, at least many Democrats believe, that we need complete investigations of the people that attacked the Capitol and intended to do harm, but also perhaps some level of accountability for colleagues that uh, participated in it, as well as President Trump, who inspired the insurrection on the Capitol. What's the right type of accountability for your Senate colleagues like Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley, who went along with uh, the big lie, which is essentially the catalyst to the insurrection. Uh, we're dealing with Donald Trump over here during the impeachment trial. Uh, but your your fellow senators obviously were complicit uh, in going along with that lie. What do you, what's the appropriate accountability for, for those folks? Well, I certainly wouldn't say that censure is inappropriate. I think that's the kind of measure that the Senate could use in this instance. Whether we will get to have a vote on that, I don't know. But I certainly don't think an, es an ethics investigation uh, would be inappropriate either. So I hope that there is some level of oversight because the recklessness and the inappropriateness of, again, creating misinformation is something that senators not only should not be part of, but certainly should be avoiding. And to the extent they were part of that narrative, I just think there needs to be some level of oversight and review. Absolutely. In terms of the COVID relief bill, obviously Republicans want to make it seem like reconciliation is this big, scary thing uh, procedurally that Democrats definitely should not do, even though we just did it. Um, what do you say to that? Uh, should, should Democrats use reconciliation if that's the only option to get the relief to the American people? Do you think that that's a strategy you know, Biden should be pretty open about? All I can tell you, Zerlina, is that my state is suffering. People in New York are desperate. So many people have lost their jobs. They have no way to put food on the table. They're worried about being evicted. And there's real fear and anxiety. So our job in Congress is to meet the need 
And if we're unable to get a bipartisan resolution that meets the need, then we should use whatever processes we can. We need money for food stamps, for pandemic EBT, all the resources for food who are hungry, all the resources for people who don't have a home and who could be evicted, resources for our first responders, for vaccinations. We have to get these vaccines out, more shots in arms. We need more resources for our healthcare system and we need money for our first responders. So these are real priorities. And I, I don't think this is the time for half measures. And I do think the politics of the moment is pretty rich coming from people who use the same process to have massive tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans. $1.5 trillion were the tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans. I would like to at least have that amount to help the people who are in grave need and to make sure we have the resources for our first responders and health professionals to get more shots in arms. It's so ridiculous when you think about it in context. I mean, at the time the tax cuts were passed and they had the little celebration in the Rose Garden with all the House Republicans. Um, I remember that day. We didn't know pandemic was coming. And in context now, when we're sitting here in the middle of the worst crisis in a generation and Republicans are saying, oh, that's what you want. We'll give you half of that or we'll give you a third of that. When, when you, you made such an important point, you have to meet the need. I don't understand sometimes why people go into a job if they aren't gonna do it. I don't get it. Um, Democrat Joe Manchin, uh, your colleague in the Senate, uh, he's gonna be probably a popular uh, senator in the next few years. Uh, he said today he opposes the $15 minimum wage uh, that's included in the COVID relief bill. Uh, you support a uh, $15 minimum wage. Do you think that, that the wage hike that's included will need to be removed for the bill to be able to pass? No, I don't. I think there is enough support for people to understand that people need a living wage. If they're working full time, more than 40 hours a week, they're going to need resources to put food on the table. And if you're earning less than $15 an hour, it's really hard to provide food for your family, to pay for housing and basic needs. Uh, it's living below the poverty line. So we shouldn't be asking full-time workers to be living below the poverty line. And I hope I have the opportunity to talk to all my colleagues about how urgent the crisis is in my state and that people need help. Absolutely. You have a paid family leave bill, and I cannot say enough how important paid family leave is. I've been able to utilize it in my own life when I had a family health crisis. So many people here in the pandemic definitely need to utilize uh, paid leave. If we had it, a lot more people would have the resources to buy the food and to have the shelter. Um, how, would it, how would it help so many of the women specifically who have had to quit their jobs during this pandemic uh, to stay home to care for their children? Well, the biggest challenge so many caregivers have had in this pandemic is that schools haven't been able to open safely. And that has caused so many families to go into disarray because if children are home, then there needs to be an adult that can watch them. And more often than not, it is the women of the household that are staying home, compromising their own jobs and careers, and some not only losing their jobs, but losing their paycheck. And when that happens, it means less resources into a home, less money for food and clothing and rent and heating. and massive anxiety. And we've seen in December, there was net 140,000 jobs lost. Well, when you net out everyone who got a job and everyone who lost a job, it was women who lost those 140,000 jobs and in a large part, women of color. So we have a long way to go to protecting all workers and making sure they can thrive in the workplace and without childcare and without national paid leave, it leaves the burden disproportionately on women. Now paid leave, we have paid leave in every other industrialized country in the world, not the United States. And so few workers get to take it. But what it would allow if we had had it during the pandemic was people could have kept their job, kept their income and stayed home for three months while their children were out of school because of the pandemic or because of an illness or because of a family member who's sick. That would have made so much sense because we could have just funded paid leave as opposed to all these other hoops we've had to jump through. So it is time for paid leave both from substantive viewpoints, but also from meeting the need, as you say, people are desperate. And if we had paid leave, less people would lose their jobs and less women would lose their foot in the economy. One question I, I wanted to ask you since the inauguration, so you're here and I can ask, 
um, is just, you know, re to reflect on Kamala Harris being the vice president, uh, the first woman to have that role. And I look back at the Democratic primary, and while we did end up with two older white gentlemen uh, as the options, we started out with a historic slate of diverse candidates and, and lots of women to choose from. If you didn't like that woman, there was another woman um, there. <laughs> you know, that was the line in 2016. Um, so, so just reflect on that experience in terms of, you know, your your candidacy coupled with so many of the other women who ran in the Democratic primary and why that's so important for the next generation um, who may want to seek uh, a higher office and become vice president or potentially president. You have to see women do it to know it's possible. I like it when Kamala says, I may be the first, but I'm certainly not the last. And I can tell you on inauguration day, seeing her up there, was so inspiring. It was a moment where every woman and every girl around the globe could know that they too could be at the highest levels of power and the highest levels of leadership. And Kamala has done this job already with such grace and such dignity. I think she you know, creates a new standard and I'm so proud of her and I stand ready to help her in any way she needs uh, as our vice president and you know, in every challenge that lays ahead. Absolutely. Senator Gillibrand, thank you so much for being here. And please, please stay safe. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen. And make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.